So, like Lucas said, I'm gonna be covering the Rui Lopez and really just wanna give it an introduction to it. So even if you don't play uh, E4 as white, uh, it's, it's still healthy for your chess development to, to learn, understand E5, even if you don't play it on a regular basis. Um, it, it's a good opening to play for both sides, I think, because most of the time the game is not determined by one or two move tactics, but by strategy, you know, where you put your pieces. You know? So in, in that sense, I think it's, it's healthy to play from both sides. So anyway, the Rui Lopez starts off with E4, E5, Knight F3. Knight c6, and and bishop b5. And this is the beginning of what's called the Rui Lopez. You might also hear it called the Spanish torture or Spanish game, because the, the Rui Lopez is uh, named after a Spanish priest. Um, I don't know if he uh, studied it in depth or played it a lot, to be honest, uh, but it's, it's named after that guy anyway. So, you know, if you follow top level chess, you'll notice that the Rui Lopez is a regular guests in tournaments. I mean, you'll see it in so many games. I mean, uh, take the re recent World Cup. I mean, today, uh, Spindler played Carioca and, and a Rui Lopez on the black side and they managed to win. You know, and you, know, you, you saw a bunch of Rui Lopez is at the Sinkfeld Cup and Norway Chess and the Zurich Chess Challenge. I mean, it's it's a very common guest. So it's, it's important to know theoretically. And, and in my opinion, the Rui Lopez is right is is basically your best bet for a theoretical advantage against e5. And that's why it's popular among top players. That's why they play it. Um, later, I will show you some other op options. But objectively, you know, in the long run, this is what you should be playing most of the time is white. So black already has a couple options here. Um, first, though, I'm going to cover one uh, just because it was traditionally the one of the first tries black did. So. D6. Uh, does anyone know what D6 is called? This is called the Steinitz defense. And as, as you might guess, it was named after first world champion Wilhelm Steinitz. And it's, it's probably the most logical, in a sense, reply to the Rui because White's move, bishop b5, hints at maybe capturing the knight and pressuring the d6 pawn. So black just immediately addresses the problem by protecting it. But on the downside of d6 is that you immediately don't challenge white's bishop and you block in your dark squared bishop, not giving you an option for more activity. And it allows white to play actively here with d4. And already black has kind of an issue because if you take on d4, white activates the knight to the center with gain of time. And if you don't take on d4, you leave white with a powerful pawn pair in the center. For example, with bishop d7, white can simply play c3 and maintain this powerful pawn center. Or you could even just castle as well. And those pawns are going to give white a pretty simple advantage. And if black doesn't play bishop d7, then of course d5 wins a piece. Yeah, of course, the, the point of d4 as well is just to threaten winning a pawn. Now, best is probably e takes d4, but after knight takes bishop d7, white has a strong move here and, and bishop takes knight. Now B takes, and now uh, my favorite move here is, is C4 for white. And the idea is moving your C pawn before knight C3 so that you're able to control the center better. And then after, you're basically going to castle and have pretty easy play. I mean, for example, knight F6, you can just castle because the pin on the E file, the pawn is immune. Say bishop B7, knight C3, castle, and now, for example, B3. And white will fan the dark squared bishop, play queen f3, and play rook a d1 or e1. And white just has really active play, no weaknesses, and dominates the center. So this is the position that I really like for white. And if you look in the database, you'll see white scores very heavily in this line. And, and uh, you also notice that it's not very popular for black anymore. You're not going to see top level players playing the Steinitz anymore. So that's, that's my recommendation there against the Steinitz. So since players discovered the Steinitz is a bit too passive, they started exploring other moves, and specifically Morphe favored this a6 move. And it immediately puts a question to the white bishop, you know, what are your intentions here? And one of the issues for white is that moving the bishop back allows black to later gain time again by pushing the bishop. 
But White does have this critical option in just taking the knight, right? Like we said, that one of the ideas of the Rui was to pressure e5. But fortunately, Black doesn't have to worry. So here you play d takes c6. And in general, in the Rui Lopez and across king pawn openings, it's important to remember that a lot of times when any, any piece is taken on c6, uh, taking with a d-pawn is oftentimes the right solution. And it's because you gain time for development and keep your, keep your pawn structure a little bit healthier. Uh, because one issue you can have with b takes c6 is that uh, if, for example, something like this happens, you have three pawn islands, right? But if you take with a d-pawn, you're left with just two pawn islands. So that's another reason that d takes is sometimes favored. Okay. Now the first point here is that white cannot win a pawn. So if knight takes e5, what's the most accurate way of playing for black? Queen to queen g5. Yeah, exactly. Queen d4. So this is a simple fork. Attack e5 and e4. White has no way to defend both. You know, if you play knight f3, you take and actually only black is going to have the better chances here with the, the two bishops. Now I will point out that you should not be tempted by queen g5 here. This is another way of re-getting the pawn because you target the knight and g2. And again, white can't defend both, but after knight f3, queen g2, rook g1, uh, th this line isn't as good as the other one. Does anyone know why? There's not a tactical reason, by the way. Black is not losing or anything. So basically, the, the main thing that happened was we exchanged pawns, right? Which pawns did we exchange? Mm -hmm. Oh, the good yes, black for a uh, good black. Yeah, e5 for g2. Yeah. yeah, it's that simple, right? So white's left with two central pawns, and white won g2, which maybe not that important. And furthermore, you know, white has this rook on an open file already. So this is not a good way of playing for black. Black's not lost, but strategically this is not a, not a good situation for black. Okay. So just don't be tempted by that. Always try to win the center pawn if you can. <clears throat> so instead, white doesn't have to take on e5. He can play, for example, just castles. And now e5 is actually undefended because if we don't defend it, you know, say we just play h6 or something, now the same tactic doesn't work because the e-file is now open, right? And white can pin the queen. And here I'm going to recommend what may look kind of silly. So my preference is, there's actually a couple possibilities here. My preference is for a queen f6 here. It may look goofy moving a queen when you haven't developed any minor pieces yet. But the idea is to A, defend the e5 pawn, which was undefended, and B, prepare to castle queenside. So black would like, if white played like knight c3, to play bishop g4, and then quickly castle queenside. And then black has a pretty harmonious position. Now white can try to cross these plans by opening up the center immediately. But this really isn't a problem for black. You can just take d4. And there are some options here, but I'll recommend, you know, I'll just cover one briefly. So say queen takes, takes, takes. And we, we have an end game which uh, will remind you of uh, something we'll go over later in the Berlin. But Black's chances here are just fine with the two bishops and a good pawn structure. And here you can continue with bishop d7 and just castling queenside. And this is a theme throughout these exchange lines, just trying to castle queenside with the bishop on d7. Now going back, I did uh, fail to mention, you know, another possibility for white here is just d4. Now this is a real old possibility. Takes, takes. So this is how white used to play this line because they, they thought the end game was good for white. Because with this perfect pawn structure, they thought white could just create a pass pawn on the king side in the end game and then win, right? Because with ba black's bad pawn structure, it's really hard for black to create a pass pawn. But it turns out it's not that bad for black. You can just play bishop d7 and then castle queen side. And since you have no problems developing, you, white really doesn't have very good chances here. So remember that theme of playing bishop d7 and castling queenside? It's, it's really common in the exchange variation. And so white does have a couple other possibilities. So after, after well, I, I should mention, so if white tries to play in slow style with d3, you can continue with bishop g4, knight d2, and say bishop d6. 
and you'll follow up with knight e7 and maybe knight g6 heading for the king side and you might even consider a pawn storm with h6 and g5 even but that's another theme of queen f6 is you try to reinforce the e5 point with a bishop on d6 maybe a knight on g6 so those are some ideas there um, another critical line with playing d4 is playing bishop g5 attacking the queen with tempo right but here it's not a problem we can just play queen d6 keeping an eye on d4 okay now if if knight takes d4 we can again just play bishop e7 you know attacking the bishop if white trades black's going to be happy if white goes back again you can just play bishop d7 and then ca get castled on the queen side And again, if, if white takes on d4, no worries. You can just, uh, I think, let's see, I think bishop d6 is most precise, and then bishop d7, f6, and castle. You do sometimes have to be careful about the weakness of the c7 pawn. So here, like f6, white might play bishop f4, and it's a little bit awkward to defend c7. So would you go so far as to say that in every exchange, or in almost every exchange variation of the ruby, that black is aiming to castle queenside? Pretty much, yeah. Um, I, I think it actually turns out that way because uh, black only has to move two pieces, mm -hmm. and it's easier for black to develop those two pieces than these two. Um, although it, that's not necessarily always the case, um, there are some lines where black will play f6, like f6 is a line that Spassky played against Fisher, um, and, and in those lines sometimes black will castle kingside. But um, yeah, a lot of times it's, it's really common for black to castle queenside in these lines. And it also has to do with the fact that black's king is usually safer on the queen side for the simple fact that there are four pawns defending the king, whereas on the king side there would only be three. It may seem weird, but those three pawns actually keep your king really safe. Or those four pawns, sorry. So yeah. Um, so basically, you're not going to see top-level GMs playing the, the exchange variation in important games. You know, basically, black has e easy play. You know, no problems developing. You know, you notice that both the bishops can they'll develop without any problems. And the simple fact that black has the two bishops is a deterrent for most GMs. You know, giving your opponent the two bishops out of the opening you got to get some serious compensation. And we will see a line later that GMs do regularly play where they do that. But Black makes a lot more concessions there than he does here. So anyway, this is the exchange variation. So as Black, the main thing to remember is that queen f6 idea. Now, you can also play uh, queen d6. It's very similar to the queen f6 lines as well. But I prefer queen f6 because it's a little more aggressive. Because here, the idea of bishop g4 is more powerful. So... Okay, so the main move is just bishop a4, just moving the bishop back, and now knight f6, putting pressure on the e4 pawn, but white actually doesn't have to do anything about it yet. White can just castle. And the point is that knight takes e4 doesn't win material. Do um, you know what knight takes e4 is called, by the way? This is called the open Rui, and it's it's been a favorite of uh, Victor Korchnoi, and among modern day players, you'll see Giri and Caruana play it as black, so it's 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 still a topical line. Um, and here, White has an important move that we'll also see against the Berlin. Um, I'll say that Rookie One is not the path to advantage for White, and the reason is that after Knight C5, Black not only gets the Bishop, but after Knight takes C5, Bishop B7, all White's managed to do is trade e pawns, and there's not really much imbalance going on, so White doesn't really have great chances for advantage. So instead of rookie one, white plays this tricky move d4. So this move obviously puts pressure on e5. But black has a problem because if you take on d4, now the e-file is wide open. And black has problems defending that knight. You know, if, if d5, knight takes d4, it gives black some big problems to deal with here. So here, the best move is b5 and then d5. And then after white takes, black plays bishop e6, and this is basically a starting point for the open Rui. 
Now, black does have this active knight on e4, but in exchange, black has these big holes on d4 and a, a really permanent soft spot on c5 too. So those dark square weaknesses will make black's life difficult in the long term. Okay, so that's the open Rui. Not going back. So more common is just bishop b7. Just a simple move preparing to get castled. And now we play rook e1 to defend e4 with the rook. Now you'll you'll see later why white doesn't play knight c3 to defend e4. Okay. So rook e1. And now white makes the first concrete threat of the game. So if black were to castle, white can actually just win a pawn here. Yeah, you just play bishop takes and then knight takes e5. Since the rook defends e4, it's not weak. Queen d4 doesn't work because e4 is protected. So after rook e1, white makes the first concrete threat, so black pretty much has to make this concession finally now, b5. Now bishop b3. Now say castles. And now is an important moment for the Rui. So in, in many king pawn openings, you might be used to white just playing a move like knight c3 here. But this is not really the idea of the Rui Lopez. The most common move here for white is c3. So this is white's strategic idea, is to play c3 and d4, and establish this, this beautiful pawn pair in the center, which should give white space and just complete control over that sector of the board. And that's why you're saying you don't play knight c3. Right? Exactly. So in the Rui Lopez, be careful about putting your knight on c3. Now it is an alternative way of playing the Rui. You can put the knight there, but it's not the critical line. You know, in, in almost all GM games, you're going to see white playing c3. It's, it's the most critical test for black. Okay. Now, the main option here for black is, is d6. Okay. Now, you have to play a little bit of finesse here, because if we play d4 right away, black can put pressure on white center with bishop g4. And black already threatens to take on d4 and, and give us problems in right, threatening to double the pawns on the king side. And d5 doesn't really help us either. Black just plays knight a5, and you know white center, central position is not really resolved because black can play c6 here and get rid of our once beautiful pawn pair. Okay. So we have to play a little bit of finesse before we play d4. So what do you what do you guys think white should do? H3. Yeah, just h3. Now white's ready to play d4 and have a center that's not really contested by black. And now, in order to contest the center, black usually moves his knight somewhere. So knight a5 is a popular try, and now bishop c2, c5, and d4. And then we've come to a big, big main line of the Rui, and already there's lots of options. Queen c7 is a very common one, called the Jagoran. Knight d7, the Karis, and both these moves are directed at defending e5. So already the black has various options here. Now, going back, uh, another option for black here is knight b8. And this was actually the move featured in today's uh, Spindler game, and knight b8 is also one of Carlson's favorite replies to the Rui Lopez. It's called the Briar variation. And the idea is to get a Philidor-like position. Now, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Philidor defense, but if you are, you'll notice that the position will become very close to one. So for example, d4, knight d7, and now much like the Philidor defense, we have this pawn structure with pawns on e5 and d6, and we have a bishop on e7, knight on f6. So those piece, pieces are all placed the same as they are in that opening. And black's idea is to play bishop b7 and c6 or c5, depending on what white does. And black has kind of a passive position, but a really flexible one. You'll notice that black can move all of his pawns except for the F pawn. So that flexibility gives black's position a pretty nice character. And like I said, it's Carlson's favorite, so that already lends it a lot of credence for me. And he has a lot of nice games if you want to check him out. Uh, so that's a Briar variation. And going back, black actually has another option here instead of D6. D6 is the most common and the most quiet, but black can also play D5 here. And this is called the Marshall Attack. You know, it's named after the famous American Grandmaster Frank Marshall. And the idea of the Marshall is to sacrifice a pawn in exchange for a lot of peace activity. 
So after e takes, knight takes, black loses his pawn. But black gets a lot of compensation. Because even though black's lost that pawn, all of white's queenside is completely undeveloped, right? So black has a lot of compensation in this line. Now white has worked out some ideas here, but if you're black and you like attacking positions instead of maneuvering, then this would be the line that you should look into. Now if you're playing a GM, it turns out the marshal is actually kind of drawish, because black has all this play, which turns out to be enough, but not really more than the pawn. But if you're playing a, a weaker player or a less knowledgeable one, and they don't know the lines, then you can easily massacre someone. So this, it's really fun. I mean, just for example, d4, bishop d6, and queen h4. I mean, it's, it's hard not to want to play an opening where you get to threaten you know, an attack like this. g3, queen h3, black already has ideas with bishop g4, and rook a e8, f5, f4, and just checkmate, right? So you can have a lot of fun in these martial lines. There are several GMs who will intentionally play a system that does not allow the martial attack. Yeah, yeah. And there are other GMs who are just like, bring it, like Karo Nakamura. <laughs> you know, he'll, he'll gladly let you play the martial attack against him. Yeah, and the martial is uh, one of those gambits that, you don't see a lot of gambits at the top level, but the martial is one of them you'll see. I mean, Carlson has played it this year, Aronian has played it, so there are some big names that still, still play this. So if you're worried about its soundness, you really shouldn't be. It's, it's, a, it's a very nice opening. And yeah, like Lucas said, you know, to try to combat the marshal, you'll see some players play a move like d3 here or h3, just to try to lessen the impact of the marshal. Now, by the way, playing h3 right here, the idea is that now after d5 and white takes, unlike the other line, white can develop the knight naturally on c3. So unfortunately, you can't really play the marshal against h3. That's, that's just the idea of it, just so you're aware. OK, so we cover the marshal, the briar, the chagorin. Let's see. And you'll note that we've, we've given names, or Warren's given names to a lot of these different lines. The Rui is probably the most studied opening in chess. There are players who or GMs who know Rui lines to say move twenty. It's not at all uncommon to um, to to hear Vishwanath Anandan talk about being in his opening prep on move eighteen. You know his eighteenth move when his opponents played eighteen moves because he's in a system that he knows. So the Rui has been played a lot. It's been studied very well at high levels, but that's high levels, right? And now there's uh, there's another major option. I should go over here, and that's uh, the Berlin with knight f6. Now this opening really wasn't too popular until Kramnik dethroned Kasparov in their 21st century world championship match, and Kramnik didn't lose a single game, and that was a that was a first for Kasparov. And you know him beating his head against the wall really made this opening popular. And White White has discovered other ways to combat it now, but it's still a very solid defense and. Um, if you're playing an attacking player as black, it's, it's an absolutely excellent opening to play. Now, the critical move here, white does have some options here. So d3 is one option that white has that, although theoretically it's, it's harder to get an advantage for white, that does keep the queens on the board. So as white, if you're not fond of endgames, you want a more complicated position, then you should play d3 here. And actually, Kasparov regrets never trying this against Kramnik. He wishes he would have tried this. Um, but the, the critical test and a, and a move you'll often see at the high level is just castling. And much like the open Rui Lopez here, the idea is that rookie one gets white nothing because black just retreats, and taking e5 is basically a nothing. Always manages to trade e pawns. So that's not really much progress. So just like the open Rui Lopez, d4 is the critical test of black setup. And much like the open Rui, E takes D, rookie one, just leads to nothing but trouble for black. So instead, black's got to solve this problem of that E5 pawn being under attack. So black plays knight D6. So now black's idea is that if white tries to save the bishop and say retreats, then he can just take this pawn. And now, although white might have some compensation for the pawn, an extra pawn is an extra pawn. So instead, white has to take this knight 
and now take e5. And now after knight f5, and we trade queens, we arrive at the starting point of the Berlin defense. Okay? And unlike the exchange Rui Lopez, although the pawn structure is almost identical, the difference is that black's king can't castle. So the king position is much more awkward. And also this knight in f5, although it, it does control the central square in d4, it's kind of misplaced because it stops us from developing this high squared bishop. So black has more problems than an exchange Rui Lopez. But, but, black does have the two bishops, and that counts for a lot. So, on the black side, pretty much every GM in the top ten I've seen play this opening from either side. I mean, I've seen Nakamura on either side, Carlson, Anand, Karyakin, uh, Kramnik, Caruana. I mean, the list goes on and on. Um, I mean, basically, the Berlin comes down to uh, a battle of black trying to blockade white's kingside pawns and white trying to advance them. So if white can manage to blockade these white kingside pawns, then black can let them sit and then target them with the two bishops. But if white manages to push them and keep them in a fluid mass and maybe make, make, make a pass pawn, then black's going to be in serious trouble. So I won't really go into the Berlin more from here, but just you know, those are your general ideas. You know, white's going to try to advance on the king side with h3, g4, and f4, and black's going to try to restrain that with maybe h5 and putting the bishop on e6 and bishop on e7 that kind of thing. You can watch the 2013 World Chess Championship Carlson Anand. Uh, this defense was kind of the hallmark of that series. I think in their you know, eight or ten matches, however many they played, at least half of them were Berlin defenses. Mm -hmm. And Carlson even managed to nick Anand for win on the black side of one of these. Yeah, yeah one interesting point to note, so I mentioned how Kramnik, uh, you know, dethroned Kasparov with the Berlin defense. You know, he never lost his black here. Uh, he, he had a win against uh, another strong GM, Alexander Grischuk. Uh, I don't remember what the exact year. It was fairly recent, though. It turned out it was, it was his first win as black with the Berlin defense. <laughs> in all his previous games, he had lost a couple and drew all the other ones. <laughs> so at the top level, it's not necessarily a great winning attempt. But I will mention from both experience and looking at other games, and Anish Giri has even talked about this opening too, that you know, it is basically an end game where if you're playing a weaker player or if you have more understanding of the position, you can easily outplay someone. Yeah, the, there are various offbeat setups. Uh, one of the sounder offbeat setups actually is uh, G6. This is called the Smithsloff, and Nakamura has ventured it as black, and as you can imagine, you know, world champion Vasily Smithsloff used to regularly play this too. And the idea is that black just wants to fian kiddo the dark squared bishop to defend e5. So it's kind of a nice way of defending that pawn. I will briefly mention a trap that you don't want to fall into. So after bishop, bishop b5, knight f6, d3, uh, you'll, you'll see some people, especially in blitz, play this knight e7 move. It's, it's very tricky though. So the idea is to play knight g6, transferring the knight to the king side in really nice motion, and play c6 and d6 and get a really solid position. Okay. Now white has to be careful here, so taking on e5 would be a blunder. So black to play and, and win. Apparently this is a trick that Kramnik has played in many simuls. <laughs> He baits people into it by playing 97, then... <laughs> yep. He'll play 97 and then yeah. oh, walk away with an exasperated <laughs> look. I just dropped a pawn against <laughs> nobody. <laughs> I feel like it starts with challenging the bishop. Good instinct? Oh, uh, yeah. C6 and then uh, queen a Mm-hmm. Oh. And white can't defend both. And there's nothing white can do because... You can't move the bishop and guard against queen a5. What if white plays knight c4, by the way? Then you just take the bishop, right? Oh, it's a slither mate. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there, there's a couple of solutions here, actually. d5? d5 is one of them. So that idea is you attack the knight, right? Again, if white moves the bishop to take the knight, Take on d5, now you can take the bishop. 
You know, the other solution is just move the knight, because if white saves a bishop, then you just fork the pieces. Okay, so let's just tricks. Appeals to me more. <laughs> yeah, knight g six would probably be my preference. But yeah, that's that's just a trick I figured I'd show you guys. Okay. So, any other questions about the Rui? Okay. So, now instead of the Rui Lopez, I'm going to show you a couple other white tries to try to trick black that aren't necessarily theoretically amazing, but they are tricky for black. So, the first I'm going to go over is the Scotch Gambit. Okay. So that goes d4 and bishop c4. And now after uh, knight f6, now e e5 is the most common move here, and it's a move that black's going to be expecting. Now, if you want to play something tricky, I'm going to recommend just castling, actually. And your idea is after knight takes e4, you'll play rook e1. Right? And now d5. White has this tricky move here with bishop yeah. takes, and now knight c3. Exploiting two pins, right? <laughs> so we can't take with a deep pawn because we lose the queen, and we can't take with the knight because the knight's pinned to the king. <laughs> so this is a nice little tactic, exploiting double pin, right? Now, you know, basically, Black needs to know what he's doing here because that open e file is very dangerous. Um, your your opponent is basically going to have to find queen h5 here. Um, if if queen d8, um, knight takes e4 is strong. Or you can also just play rook takes e4 and then wrap up the d4 pawn uh, yeah. with with a good position. So, it, you know, if you're if you're white and you're confident your poet doesn't know what they're doing, then this might be a nice line. So anyway, if black does play correctly with queen h5, you play knight takes e4. Of course, we're now threatening mate with knight f6 and rook e8. So bishop e6. And now white has a really annoying move here because. Black would like to just castle queenside here, but here you can play bishop g5. Now, if Black just says, "Okay, you know, go away, get off the diagonal," now you have this really fun move in bishop f6. Oh, fortune! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But is, is it the same if they play f6 instead of h6? Yeah, f6 is even worse for Black, oh, of course, wow, look at that. because you just take. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so this is a fun line going to be tricky for white. And after h6, bishop f6, you just let your bishop sit there because black can't really push it away. And you know if if you can, you'll be happy to play. You know knight takes d4 next, right? Now if if black attacks your bishop, you can continue to be annoying. You can just say no. <laughs> you can you can still refuse to let black castle. And, and after you take on d4, it's going to be an annoying position for black. Now that being said, black does have a good move after bishop g5. So theoretically, black is doing fine after bishop d6. Oh. It's just not intuitive because you know you you allow white to double your your queenside pawns, but because black is up a pawn, black can afford that luxury. Okay. Now white can still play for this bishop f6 cheapo, by the way. <laughs> And, and if you're convinced your opponent won't be able to calculate this, you can do it. But here, black has a strong move in bishop takes h2. Mm. The idea is that you can't refuse a bishop because bishop c4 is unfortunate. And if we take the bishop, then queen d1, followed by takes. And after all the fireworks, black ends up up a pawn in the end game. So even though this line is good for black, black has to know all these 14 moves of theory. So this is a tricky line to play as white if, if you don't think your opponent's knowledgeable. So that's one idea, playing the Scotch Gambit. Um, another one is playing uh, the Scotch. So d4 takes, knight takes. And so after knight f6, you guys might be familiar with knight c3, which is one of the main lines, and which leads to somewhat dry positions for white. But here you can play knight takes c6, which is called the Mises variation. And it was actually played by Kasparov himself against Karpov in their world championship matches. And, and Kasparov actually achieved pretty good results with it. So it is playable. And the, the main attribute for white is that it's really complicated. 
So B takes C6. Not D takes. Yeah. So unfortunately, after D takes C6, we have a position similar to the Berlin, but here white has both bishops still. So white's made no concession, but black's king is still misplaced. So here we played b takes, and now white has this annoying move, e5. So this gains space for white and forces black knight, black's knight to take a fun tour around the board. So knight, knight d5 is, is one option. Queen e7 is the most popular, because black would like to force a misplacement of white's queen. You know, f4 here isn't that great, because black can again just challenge that center. So usually queen e2 is played. So now both queens are kind of awkwardly placed in front of their bishops. Now black has to move his knight, knight d5, and now we can continue chasing it with c4. And although white doesn't have a theoretically great position, it, the positions are really complicated and kind of illogical, so if you want to specialize with this in white, you can achieve pretty good results. Yeah, this else, you're going to cost your opponent valuable clock time as they try to figure out yeah. what the heck to do, where to put that knight. Yeah, I mean, it's, the positions get really, really, really crazy. I mean, if you, if you want to look at some examples, definitely take a look at Kasparov's games. You'll end up with really illogical positions where calculation and tactics are, are key. So this, this Mises variation and that, that Scotch Gamble line would be what I'd recommend if, if you want more of a tactical slugfest as white instead of something kind of maneuvering game in the Rui Lopez. Yeah, this is important because your opponent is probably going to know standard Rui stuff. But if you know uh, variations and, uh, you know, aggressive attacking lines, that you're going to have a much better chance that your opponent won't. They'll say, wait, that's not a book move. Or it's not one of my book moves. Right? And then all of a sudden you've got, you've got the clock thing, you've got the confidence thing, and you've got a potentially devastating attack. So any questions about anything we've covered so far? All right.